Okay, we're done with the heavy stuff. Now it's time to actually go in and fight some monsters. Now, there's one bit of a writing quirk, I would say. Uh, well, more of a semi-plot hole. But, like, Morgana is all like, Hey, let's go into the, in, into the dungeon today, like, and stuff. But then, after today, Morgana's like, No, wait, we should prepare before we go in, right? It, it really confuses me when I think about it. It's like, for some reason, Morgana has no problem going in on Friday, but on Saturday, Morgana is suddenly like, hey, we should get medicine, and we should get some weapons and stuff. And, uh, I don't get it. <laughs> but yeah, we're going into the dungeon today. Why not? Well, it's Dude Game Plus. We have all of our stuff. Well, yeah, but I'm not going to be using most of the equipment. You do get to keep your equipment for New Game Plus, which basically allows you to curb stomp everything in the early game with no effort whatsoever. I'm disappointed that Ryuji's nickname is Skull and we don't get a fat party number we can name Bulk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, maybe next game. Assuming they they repeat the stupid costumes and masks thing. Fun thing that I that I heard before is that Persona 4 actually did have the concept for masks as uh, the summoning medium. I don't necessarily know it would have taken this specific form, but it was a thing before the glasses. So it's interesting to see them bring that back, especially considering that Personas, well, are supposed to be masks. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good thing none of your party members of Persona 4 actually wear glasses normally, or that'd be weird. <laughs> I mean, would they just put the extra glasses over their glasses and have two pairs of glasses on? Reminds me of the struggle of putting on 3D glasses when they go to the movies, which is why yeah. I prefer to watch uh, them like I saw without the 3D. One with Becca last year, last holiday season, and I had to do that because I wear glasses. But it, we went we went to a 3D showing, and we were in the back row. I'm nearsighted, so I had to watch the entire thing blurry-eyed through the 3D glasses because it's impossible to watch without the 3D glasses. It looks even yeah. worse. So I liked the movie. It might have been a mercy, though, because it was impossible to tell that 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 that, uh, that, that Tarkin was a CG abomination. Um, <laughs> somehow I was still able to tell that Leia was one, though. That's, uh, that was that's kind of impressive in a way. <laughs> well, probably because you know what Carrie Fisher looks like as an older woman. Whereas probably all you know from Peter Cushing is Tarkin. Yeah, that might have been it. Might have been just an optical illusion kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, that was a thing. I still need to watch Rogue One properly without the blurry vision. But I did like the movie. Just not as much as Force Awakens. Yeah, that was basically my opinion as well. Uh... Well, anyway, uh, King Kamushita and his shadow minions are all gathered out in the Great Hall, which means we can't go through the front. But this basically means is that you can't go that way until you find your way around to it later, in the, later on in the dungeon. Once you find your way to the front hall, it's mysteriously empty, and you can go back to the dungeon floor down below, but there's basically no reason to do that. So, I mean, I think if, if you're intent on getting absolutely everything the dungeon has to offer in one go, you can go down there and grab one or two little trash treasures. Which you can't get in this run. You, you, you don't start getting trash treasures until the dungeon starts properly in the next part. But there are these items that you can search throughout the dungeon that you'll just get little trash loot from. And you want to get all of that, as much of that as you can, because you can sell it all for money later. Also, hey, Pixie gets to be our first demon again. It always makes me smile when, a, when an SMT game does that. I have no idea why Slime was the first Persona you got in Persona 4. Maybe that just says something about, uh, about Yu Norikami's personality, I don't know. One of the quirks of Persona 3, though... Uh, which is especially funny when you consider that 100% requires basically forming a harem. Like, all of the personas that you can collect in the first dungeon area in Tartarus are women. Uh, which, I, I don't know, that made me laugh when I realized it on my third playthrough. 
I like how there's an option to just say nothing and stand there. <laughs> I've never selected it, but I'm curious. What happens when, when, when you pick that option here? I feel like no matter what, you're definitely going to get this persona. Oh yeah, yeah. This is a a fixed situation where this th th this whole setup is basically there to to reveal that you can use multiple personas, which is something that you're directly told by Igor in the other games. But here, for some reason, the reveal is in this in this cutscene out in the open where the other characters can react to it, which I think is more satisfying. But it's also act out of character for Igor. The um. Well, intentionally so, but the, uh, the, the, um, it's interesting in the sense that it actually allows the characters to react to it, like, properly. I mean, occasionally in the previous two games there's a throwaway line, like, oh, they can use, th this guy can use more than one persona is, is really, really special, uh, but it's not something that you get a dedicated scene for with your other party members and it's and it's in personas three and four it's it's an oddity that you can do that it's something that only you can do and none of the others can so you'd expect to see more of a reaction to that but it never comes up dun, 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 yeah 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 <laughs> was that supposed to be pokemon yeah original pokemon catch thing mm -hmm. Yeah, that that theme is burned into my brain because I spent so many hours on my old Game Boy Pocket playing Red and Blue. For real? I caught a monster with it. Maybe I should ta paint the top part red. But yeah, they actually sort of they actually sort of acknowledge the specifics of demon negotiation in a story sense, which is not something that generally happens too much in Shin Megami Tensei. I mean, it's something that just sort of happens in battle, and you know, that's it. It happens in battle, and it's how you get your demons. You don't really have party members in Shin Megami Tensei who are there to react to that. I think SMT4 has other demon summoners that are basically able to do the same thing, so it's nothing special. But the difference between Persona and Shin Megami Tensei, for those of you who aren't familiar with these two series, is that in Persona, when you recruit a demon or a Persona, um, whether it's through negotiation in this game or from the stupid card shuffle thing in the last two games, it just becomes a, a switch out move set for your main character. You swap, it, it, your main character can switch between the Personas and use their different moves, and you can keep up to, I think, you start out with six slots, then eight slots, then 10 slots, then 12 slots. Really annoying thing in Persona 5's case, it's not based on your level anymore. It's actually based on where, what point in the game you're at. So in Personas 3 and 4, when you started a new game plus, you'd have all 12 of your goddamn Persona slots opened up at the start of the game, which was a pretty goddamn useful thing. But here, you're back to 6 slots at the start of the game, which is kind of goddamn restricting. The, um... The, 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 uh, in, pers in mainline SMT, though, the demons you recruit are just additional party members. Like, they are your party. You have your main character, you have your demons, and maybe Dante for shits and giggles if you played that particular part of that particular game. I actually would not recommend recruiting Dante. He's not particularly good. <laughs> I mean, he's supposed to be good, but the game is sort of geared against physical skills, and his skills are physical yeah. skills. So, it's it's sort of the case of him having the wrong element to really make an impact at the point in the game that he appears in. I'm not sure what game you're referencing. Are we talking about Dante from Devil May Cry? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> in Shin Megami Tensei 3, Nocturne... Uh, one of the, an optional party member you can recruit after, like, I think three optional boss fights against him at different points in the game is Dante. Devil May Cry 2 Dante, which makes me so happy. I'm so glad that costume got to be featured in an actual good game. In exchange for this, uh, Kaneko, I think, the, uh, demon designer for SMT, designed the Devil Trigger mode for, uh, Devil May Cry 3. Oh, that worked. That worked out well. Yeah, that's why that that's why that worked out. So uh, that's why I wound up looking so weird. But um, 
Uh, I think in like the Japan only final release of Nocturne, Dante got switched out for a cameo for, for uh, optional boss Raido Kuzunoha, although from from another SMT series. But uh, while Raido Kuzunoha is technically better for the game stats wise and moves wise, uh, he doesn't actually have any dialogue when he appears. It's kind of strange that they decided to do that. I think maybe his talking cat appears and might say a thing or two. I'm not really sure. I haven't seen those scenes yet. But, um, well, I, I haven't gone out of my way to watch them. I just sort of looked it up on YouTube. Wait, one of the accessories is a fanny pack? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I can just see Karusu running around a palace in this getup but with a fanny pack up front. <laughs> Well, there are a lot of costumes, and they do show in the dungeon if you decide to put them on and run around with them. Um, speaking of the costumes, that's a good yeah. good timing on, on mentioning that. One of the costumes is, in fact, a Raido Kuzunoha pack. Morgana gets a black cat outfit to look like Goto the talking cat, and your main character is Raido, and I think there's costumes based on other characters for the other characters. It's a really nice looking outfit. The cool thing about the costume packs in this game though, and I won't be showing this until Mementos, but when you put on the costume packs from other games, the battle music will change based on what your main character is wearing. So if you want to grind, uh, just switch out costumes every once in a while to stop the music from driving you insane. It's actually a pretty handy thing. There are also free costume packs for, like, you can battle in the school uniform and your day clothes and your summer clothes and your winter clothes and your lounge wear for some reason. But, uh, they don't change the battle theme, I think. But, like, they, 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 they have costume packs for games I wasn't really expecting. Persona 1 and 2 made the cut, which is odd because they rarely reference those games. But they also have a costume pack for Shin Megami Tensei If, which is the sort of Proto Persona Shin Megami Tensei game they did before Persona, that a lot of Persona 1's mechanics were inspired by or directly taken okay. from. Isn't there a character from If in Persona 1? Oh, yeah, it's uh, T T Tamaki, I think her name is. She's the female protagonist option for that game, which I yeah. guess means that canonically the protagonist of that one is a girl. Uh, she appears in the first game, and you can talk to her in one of the rooms at the school, and she'll give you a sword and make a remark how sh about how she used it during some trouble at her old school but doesn't need it anymore and it'll probably help you more but um <laughs> yeah. in persona 2 she's um featured a bit more prominently she works as a as an assistant at the kuzunoha detective agency which is important to the game because it's where you spread rumors um and that and, and persona 2 is about uh supernatural phenomena turning rumors into reality which is why hitler is a thing in that game because there was a rumor <laughs> that hitler was alive and hiding out in japan and uh, <laughs> <it's>, uh <laughs> this is so real. it comes true <laughs> oh it's a thing oh yeah yeah so it so it comes true and hitler or the fuhrer depending on what version of the game you're playing is <laughs> the the boss before the final boss what <laughs> is the final boss super aryan yeah. hitler in a in, in persona Kinda. two innocent sin <laughs> in, innocent sin specifically not eternal punishment, so the final boss of the first part of the game. Anyway, yeah. Um, one of the things about demon dialogue is that the Jack series of demons, Jack O' Lantern, which is Pyro Jack in other games, and uh, Jack Frost, those ones, they all have their own specific way of speaking, which means these are the demons that are going to stick out most in your mind in terms of negotiation dialogue, because they're the only ones that go hee-ho all the time. Uh, <laughs> most of the other demons have, like, like they, they have dialogue styles based on, like, three, four, five dialogue styles that basically make them sound like children or old men, that kind of thing. And the SMT did that kind of stuff too. When you have so many demons, you can only have them so say so many things without spending an ungodly number of years on writing. But uh, it's, a, it's, it's a little too restricting. I, I kind of feel like because the game is so much bigger than something like Undertale, they can't t tailor all of the negotiation personalities to specific monsters. It's like, Undertale is like, what, four or five, six hours long, depending on how fast you're playing, maybe. Sounds about right. 
And, you know, so in Undertale, every monster has their own dialogue and their own specific dialogue choices you have to pick to spare them. Whereas in this one, throughout the game, you start to realize that the demons are repeating a lot of lines. And that's useful to the player because they're repeating lines that you've that you've heard before and responded to before. So if you pick the dialogue option in response to that line earlier in the game and it didn't work, it won't work there. And if you picked a dialogue option in response to that line earlier in the game and it did work, it's going to work again. Which is different than I remember Nocturne being. I think Nocturne had an element, element of RNG to all of its uh, negotiation choices that basically made it a bit of a crapshoot. But um, Also another thing SMT does with demon negotiation that Persona 5 doesn't is having the demons constantly ask you for life stones. Fuck that shit. It's like, I want to use my life stones, they're healing items, but I have to keep them all in my inventory because I know demons are going to ask for life stones every five minutes. <laughs> you can get items and money from demons, and in fact, one viable tactic for, um, uh, for negotiation, if, if you want to, you know, min-max your, um, your, your experience and money gain a little bit, is to intentionally wipe out every demon except one and then negotiate with the other demon with the with the last remaining demon for money if you negotiate with a demon while other demons are alive the battle will end and you won't gain any money or experience for the demons you didn't kill so it's always a good idea to kill all of the demons except the one you plan to negotiate with so you'll still get the the XP and the money rewards for those demons uh -huh. However, if you negotiate for money, it's the odds are very good that you'll get more money than you would have gotten by just killing them. The item gains from negotiation are generally kind of crap. Like, I would make use of that for the first dungeon if you're trying to get it done in one day, because getting the dungeon done in one day on a fresh new game is basically impossible without stretching your resources to their absolute limit. But the, um... The uh, Later on in the game, I wound up getting a lot of items that I didn't necessarily need, and I always felt like I had wasted a, a negotiation when I asked for an item. I think certain demons have really good items, but without a guide, you kind of just have to blindly experiment with negotiation a bunch. And, um, yeah. I just going for the overpowered item you carried over. Nah, I'm just... I, I'm not doing that. Uh, I'm equipping the weapon that I just got, but... Yeah, I do have a bunch of overpowered swords, and if I did that, this would be a very boring playthrough, because, well... You would just one-shot everything. Yeah, <laughs> basically. It would be Persona 3's New Game Plus. <laughs> now, Persona 3's New Game Plus was even worse, because you didn't start out at level 1 as your protagonist, but everyone else sure did. <laughs> like, you got to keep your protagonist's level, so you were at level 80-something, but... Everyone else was level 1, so they basically didn't do jack shit for you. You got to keep everything in that game, I think. I think some SMT games with New Game Plus actually let you pick individual things to keep on your New Game Plus. But uh, Persona 5, it's just you keep your equipment, you keep your romance chocolate, and you keep your uh, Persona Compendium and other obvious things to keep. That was always my favorite thing about the Tales series. The Tales games, like Tales of Symphonia, Tales of Legendia, uh, they always let you keep very specific things that you asked for. Like, you could be you could be like, I don't want my game time to carry over. <laughs> like, if I spent 100 <laughs> hours, I go into a new playthrough, now it's zero hours. I can keep my money, I can keep my weapons, I can keep my, uh, my levels, you know. There's a lot of things you could check off and check on to carry over into the next playthrough, and uh, I like that. Yeah, having those options is nice. I think, like, the only real option that you had in Persona um, in Persona 3 Portable was to play in, ins in fucking insanity mode, or whatever the highest difficulty was called, and you wouldn't be able to carry over anything in a New Game Plus for that mode. So I think, like, the only reason to do a New Game Plus in, in, in the highest difficulty was to get to the optional boss fights. And at that point, I don't know how you've stuck with it for so long, frankly. It doesn't matter now. We must take her back to King Kamashita. I do like this th this sense that you're sneaking around the palaces. It's very... It makes you feel like a ninja badass, frankly. 
and it carries over into the cutscenes at times, but as soon as you get like the cover system unlocked from its specific tutorial part way into the next dungeon session we're going to be doing, but um, it, it starts to feel really uh, cathartic in gameplay. The problem is that the cover system is slightly jank, and until you get used to it, it's going to feel a bit awkward. I got I got used to it pretty quickly in my initial run, but I I, I play a lot of really jank games, so I'm used to getting uh, I, I, minor jank like that doesn't really put me off for very long. I can usually adjust to it pretty quickly. But um, <laughs> for GameCube PS2 standards, Persona Five is fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's actually a good way to put it. Yeah, uh, cover systems in um in PS2 GameCube games like B we did Beyond Good and Evil on this channel a while ago, and that that game's cover system was pretty pretty goddamn basic as well. Um, in fact, the stealth system was even more basic. I wouldn't even say it was all that great for PS2 standards. Everything was a one solution puzzle. <laughs> yeah. Like, Batman Begins was very much a Splinter Cell type experience, but, like, you could only play it one certain way. There was no experimentation, there was no way to, like, do it in, like, oh, maybe I'll try and sneak it past the guards this way, or throw gas this way, and it was just, like, Batman so Begins. boring. Yeah. Yeah, the Batman Begins game for GameCube and PS2. There was a Batman Begins game. Oh, yes. God. Yeah. <laughs> it was a part this stealth was... game, part combat, but it was no Arkham. Yeah. Yeah, it, w it was still back when they still made movie tie-in games. <laughs> anyway, yeah, this is probably the only time we're going to see it on screen for even a half a second in this playthrough, because w once you unlock the cover, once I unlock the cover system specifically, I'm, I'm so used to the game now that I never get spotted. But there's an alert system, and in theory, if you get that alert system up to 100%, you get booted out of the dungeon for the day. So it is something to watch out for. However... If you know what you're doing, there's basically no reason to not get preemptive strikes on every goddamn random enemy in the goddamn game. It is a, it is a hell of a lot easier to get preemptive strikes in this game because when the alert system is at 0%, there's, there's like a buffer period of about a full second before an enemy will spot you unless you're running. So if I you believe just... it also does the, uh, what The Last of Us essentially does is that your party members don't count towards enemy vision. Oh yeah, vision. I mean... I mean Ryuji is standing right in front of this goddamn soldier, and they're not sitting him. But uh, it's it's a good thing to know because older games don't do that. So yeah, the th the thing about it is, um, when you're at zero percent, you can also launch a preemptive strike from any direction. If you're above zero percent, you have to go from behind. But if you're at zero percent, which I almost always am in this game, you um. You, you, you can launch a preemptive strike from any direction as long as you hit the button fast enough. Your character will jump up and rip off the shield and everything. Now, something to be aware of during this dungeon run specifically to the one to get on. After this dungeon run, there is going to be a tutorial with Igor. And that tutorial with Igor is going to be about fusions. And, um... Does this might... involve a stupid dance? No. It, it, you might be tempted to collect all of the demons that you can possibly get during this dungeon run, including this one, Incubus. If you want to keep Arsene, and I would recommend keeping Arsene because as opening game personas go, he's probably the most useful of the bunch. Uh, because he has Dream Needle, which is actually a pretty goddamn excellent skill to take with you through this dungeon in particular. Um, if you want to keep Arsene without fusing him because... Uh, the fusion is forced, and uh, you won't get a chance to get uh, register Arsene in your compendium before you do it. Get every demon in this area except Incubus, because you will be able to fuse an Incubus with two of the others, and that will allow you to keep Arsene. It's kind of an it's kind of a mean trick that the game pulled, and um, I really wanted to keep Arsene with me throughout the entire game, and in fact I did. When we get to the compendium, you're going to see that I, I leveled him up to a ridiculously high level and, and had him inherit a bunch of high-level skills. But, um... If you want to keep Arsene with you, you're, you're either going to go in blind and you're going to lose Arsene because you picked up all the demons during this demon run, or you're going to, um... or you're going to find a way to cheese through it. Because if you have all of the demons, the only viable fusion is with Arsene. And that itself is deliberate, because when you try to fuse Arsene for the first time, a special cutscene happens, where he basically tells you that he'll be back. <laughs> um, 
it's it's another case where the personas in this game are unusually chatty. But, uh... I mean, it's cool, but I was slightly annoyed the first time I played. I had to fuse away Arsene, but I leveled him up during this dungeon run, and I got some neat skills, and I wanted to keep doing that. But I had to start over from scratch with Arsene at his base level, which was annoying as fuck. But yeah, I, uh, you might notice that I'm not quite skipping the random battles just yet. There is a reason for that. And the reason for that is that in the first dungeon, the enemies wound up changing up a little too quickly from, for cutting out random battles to really matter. Well, it's also important to... Uh, it's something I always enjoy of RPG LPs that do generally cut past random battles is at least keep them in for their first portion of the game, whether they use a dungeon-like setup or in more arena settings like maybe Chrono Trigger to keep it in for a little while to let you know how the general pace of the game is going to feel like. Yeah, uh, but the, the thing about that is I didn't need to cut out random battles at all for the first dungeon. The only thing I needed to cut out was a sequence of backtracking toward the end of the dungeon where um, where the, 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 where you have to sort of backtrack through the same two rooms twice and fight the same enemies. Um, and that got, that got tedious. But, like... For the first dungeon, most of the battles play out differently, and since it's hard mode, a good number of the battles actually did <laughs> end up kicking my ass at least part of the way through. So, uh, I also wanted to show off various negotiation responses, though, so that maybe players watching who want to get an edge on how to get their favorite demons might actually... Um, benefit from that so if there's a negotiation i'll always leave that in unless it's the same negotiation i just showed off a few minutes ago which might happen in the later dungeons but doesn't tend to happen here however you will notice even when i am cutting out random battles that i obsessively go after every enemy on the field regardless of the circumstances i probably should have run past those demons <laughs> To, to rescue on, but I, I couldn't help it. If it's a non-random battle type RPG, like Persona, Grandia, or uh, Chrono Trigger, I just go after every battle I can. Gotta get that XP, man. <laughs> yeah, just one one sec. I I I need to I need to straighten my gloves. Won't want to leave fingerprints. Okay, so An sort of got kidnapped by the shadows who mistook her for the uh, fake version of, of, of An that we saw last part. Speak of the devil and she shall appear in cat ears, apparently. I'm you, but hotter. <laughs> but you look exactly the same. <laughs> the thing about uh, cognitive An over here is that she talks like an absolute airhead. Like... Her lines are straight up bad porno lines. I, I like. I realize that's also intentional, but it, 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 it's it's kind of cringy, intentionally so. And I would not want to be on hearing a version of on saying those lines. It would be goddamn humiliating. I like how that's where her mind jumps. Like these people in armor with the weird masks. Kamoshida's got creepy yellow eyes. There's there's a weird sort of ambience around, and, and you you assume red light just district. What do you think? Colored contact lenses are one of Kamoshida's kinks? Uh, I don't know. But like that's not where my mind would jump if an exact duplicate of myself walked into the room. I would just think I'd gone crazy, or I was having a nightmare. I would probably think I was having a nightmare. One of the unfortunate downsides of the whole shadow thing is that the, the voices of the shadows tend to sound really awful at times. And that shows in this scene here a couple of in a couple of places. Dude, now, that's gross. Now, there were cognitive apparitions of the volleyball team girls on the floor over there. Uh, topless and sort of silhouetted. But... 
we didn't, we, we're never allowed to go back into this room after this, so I have no idea what the context of this room is in, in regards to Kamashita's, uh, you know, psyche. This porno room. Well, yeah, it's got that painting in the back and everything, but... But like the other rooms in the in the ca in the castle are all explorable, and the characters comment on them. Sometimes to a point that makes you that makes you want to say, "Okay, I get it. Y you can stop spelling it out for me." But they comment on it, and you know, you can walk around the room and look around it and think about what you're saying, and that's kind of that's kind of neat. You don't get that with this room. It's just kind of it is kind of there. It just always seemed the same to like is with the boys, where this is how he views them. Like he views all the girls on the volleyball team as sexual playthings, like he viewed On. Like he was trying to have a thing with On, and she kept refusing, and that's all this whole business with Shiho happened. Like he's a skeevy, like horrible perv, and that's how he just views women. Period. Yeah, but it's just kind of it's kind of odd to me that that you could walk around and sort of take it in with the with, with the boys in the dungeon who were all, who were being shot at with volleyballs and made to run on doomsday conveyor belts but you can't do that here i don't know maybe it rubs me the wrong way like um uh, the designers didn't trust the player with that this room is locked off after this point it's the only part of the castle that is locked off what was i thinking and then uh i don't know it just sticks out when it's the only thing that you can't really go back to. I think maybe there are parts of the dungeon that you can't go far into uh, when you go back down there, if you do for some reason. But since you already walked around there before, it's not as much of a loss. But yeah, it's time for another specially animated awakening cutscene. Uh, the, the the dialogue that Carmen says in An's head here is kind of grammatically jank. Forgiving him was never the option. Uh, don't you mean an option? Uh, you know, uh, that, 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 that's how articles work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah. Uh, it's just kind of, it, like... When I see grammatically screwed up dialogue that's text only, I can sort of revise it with my brain, read it the way it was meant to be written, and move on. Like, even for something really horrible, like this guy are sick. But when it's voiced, I can't do that. <laughs> the game has already read out a line that should not have been spoken in, hu in, in a human voice. And uh, This it, is it, great. I love this. How did she do that that sort is huge i mean i know it's a mental construct and it's probably the same weight as uh, one of those cosplay <laughs> keyblades but still you're a scumbag bitch now i said before that the weapons manifest along with uh, the, the persona the first time like uh, they're consciously making the uh, the choice to buy better versions of the same weapon that appeared with their persona but uh that's not something the story really acknowledges but you know cat suit on gets a whip because we couldn't make the cat woman co parallels any more obvious yeah 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 uh, and you know it, it's something that she's uncomfortable with but the cool thing about it is that some of her upgraded weapons are whip swords which doesn't make me think cat woman it makes me think bloodborne and anything that reminds me of bloodborne is a good thing in my book well, there are whip swords in the uh, ca in the Castlevania games from like Symphony of the Night and stuff. Are there whip swords? I mean, I know there are chain whips, but that's more or less what I'm getting at. They're they're they're, they're bladed whips, so. I mean, like for some reason, Simon always goes into the castle with his regular whip and doesn't keep the chain whip after upgrading it. Uh, I don't get it. It's a special whip. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a gameplay mechanic. <laughs> Uh, there was the chain whip in Lords of Shadow, uh, the good Lords of Shadow, the first one, not the questionable sequel, but, um, yeah, that wasn't so much a sword whip as it was an extending chain that came out of a cross thing, combat cross, I think it was called. I thought that was an interesting concept, but... <laughs> I, I do like to see that, uh... We got a sneak preview of Travis Touchdown's persona for uh, No More Heroes 3. 
The, the great thing about bringing Shin Megami Tensei demons into a game that starts with Kamashita is that they already have demons that are perfectly fitted to Kamashita's personality. Just pull that one demon, Belphegor, the one who sits on a toilet the whole time, and have him represent some part of Kamashita's psyche. We don't even have to design a new monster. <laughs> well, he, is a, he is a huge shit, so... Uh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I see what you did there. The, uh, now, the thing about sub-boss demons um, is that they don't always have the same weaknesses as their normal demon counterparts, um, and you can't negotiate with them at all. So whenever you get like the enemy down, just all-out attack them. You won't get any result from anything else. I don't even know why they give you the option. Well, I know why they give you the option, because in other games, whenever you had an all-out attack, you could always back off in case you wanted to do something else strategic with your extra turn. But, um... They do give each each boss individual lines if you try, though. Yeah. Like, you can try talking to them and they'll just rebuff you. Now, I actually recommend trying to talk with them, actually. Not because it'll work, but because you don't get penalized for trying. It's not like you wasted your all-out attack. Yeah. They, they'll, they'll just say, we can't talk, and you're booted back to the all-out attack menu. So, yeah. Now, you know, this dialogue sequence would go a bit better if you weren't stuck in your combat pose. One of the things that does slightly bug me about Persona 5 is that the combat poses are a lot more exaggerated than I'm used to seeing from this series. Like, On, it kind of sticks out with On, but it's also true of other characters like um, uh, Haru whose combat pose makes so little sense that her weapon frequently clips through the floor. Um, but uh, uh, it's just it's just kind of a weird quirk of this game. Like they're trying a little too hard to be stylish at times. Like they couldn't let the character design just stick speak for itself with some characters, so they had the characters really um, uh, act out whatever it was that their costume was supposed to portray. Which makes no sense with regard to the writing because right here, like On looks down at herself and she's like, "Oh God, what am I wearing?" But she was, but she was acting a few seconds ago like she already knew she was wearing a cat suit and was really getting into it, and I'm not really sure why. Like, if there's some lore reason for that, if it's ever brought up, I forget. I forget about it completely. Yeah, it's just adrenaline. You, know? you wake up, your your awakening happens, and all of a sudden you just know you can summon this persona and do all these weird powers with it, like. How do these thoughts just, like, occur into your head? How do you just instinctively know you can do these things? I don't know, but some kind of action kicked in with her, and then she, once, the, once you know, the, the action's calmed down, she can finally assess the situation and be like, well, wait, what the hell? <laughs> Why did that happen? I mean, the combat poses in the other games were sometimes a bit stupid. You had Junpei wielding a katana like a baseball bat, which is a good way to break it, and then you had Yosuke listening to music on over-ear headphones while he fights. Like, even during the serious business battles, where that's probably not a good idea. But for the most part, the, the, the battle poses were kind of believable, somewhat. Like, as believable as standing in a circle around a bunch of shadows can be. Uh, but, um... They kind of overdo it with a couple characters in this game, and it's a, it kind of bugs me. Have you calmed down, Lady Ellen? Um, but, uh... Yeah, now On can hear the talking cat. Meanwhile, in the real world. <laughs> I kind of like that little detail there. I mean, we kind of skated past it, but like, Ryuji's thoughtful enough to bring two drinks. You know, one for An and one for his, his partner. But he doesn't think that maybe the maybe the magazine model would like something a little healthier than soda. Uh, that fits Ryuji to a T. Thoughtful and yet so thoughtless. Um, it's the little things that, that that stick out sometimes. Like, Atlas is often about as subtle as a brick to the face, but you'd be surprised how many details in even their most unsubtle games, like this one, are actually kind of really well thought out. One of the things that gets me about this whole setup, though, is that even if we even if we screw up, there's nothing that's going to make on, that that's going to go wrong for On. Like Ryuji's going to get expelled. 
Uh, Mishima is going to get expelled. Uh, Karisu is uh, going to get expelled. And then arrested. Um, but An is just going to be fine. She's 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 going to be angry, but she's going to be fine. I don't and think she's going to be fine at all. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure Shiho is still hard. going to wake up. It's going it's going to be an unhappy conversation, but Shiho's going to wake up. Kamashita is still going to be bugging the hell out of her. I don't think she'll be fine at all. Even if you said no, well, you know, it's it's um like that shit ain't going away. Well, well, yeah, An is going to be bugged, but she's not going to have any reason to really put up with it anymore. So, well, none of the other students do either. But shit happens. I mean, when this whole situation ends, people come up to her and apologize for spreading rumors about her and all that stuff. But there's no, there's no hideous negative consequence for Ana if this plan goes sour. And it's just it, it's just kind of odd that they that they gave two out of the three party members a a specific sort of game over situation, but on just sort of escaped that clause by virtue of not being there at the time. I doubt something is dangerous. Anyway, this particular uh, Sainijima scene makes me laugh in hindsight because like it wouldn't be odd if you had someone that was proficient in deceiving the eyes of others. The joke is that on is a bad actor. A horrible actor. <laughs> and she doesn't get slightly good at it until, like, the end of the game. So, I don't know... I don't know how this fits. <laughs> it's like, Sainijima thinks you had someone who's really good at deceiving the eyes of others on your team. And I just imagine now, Karusu looking down and saying, No, no, we really did not. <laughs> We just, got ex we just got really, really lucky that everyone was an idiot. <laughs> I'm just really lucky, okay? <laughs> Anta Kamiki is a slightly unorthodox in in her um, confidant because she actually starts with baton pass at rank one, which is not true of any other any other party member. They only did this so that they could give you a baton, baton pass tutorial the moment you get back into the into the action. But uh, everyone gets baton pass at rank two. And Baton Pass is the most useful skill in the game to get from Confidants. And you want to get it for every one of your party members as soon as possible, because whenever you get a one more, it allows you to pass your turn over to that character, give them another turn in place of your, your, your own extra turn, and it basically gives you a hell of a lot more flexibility in exploiting weaknesses. It's a really great addition to the, to the battle system. And when you know what you're doing, it's really fun. Oh, yeah. Plus, it also boosts their attack, right? Yeah. yeah. The only restriction is that you can only baton pass to people who have the baton pass ability unlocked in their confidant, and you can only baton pass to each character one time, and you cannot baton pass back to the person who baton passed in the first place. So you can go through each of your party members one time in that turn. I think that's also a trophy, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's a trophy yeah. for, for, for baton passing through your entire party in one go. Um, which is not a hard thing to do, but I didn't bother to do it until, like, two-thirds of the way through the game, because I just wasn't thinking about it, you know? Okay. But I don't want a cat. <laughs> Someone is playing a first-person shooter downstairs right now. You know how I know that? Because my fucking floor is vibrating with every shot. The surround sound is on. God damn it. <laughs> <sighs> the badass system, you could feel it from the floor. Well, downstairs, there's this big TV, and it's got speakers attached to the ceiling and the walls all around the room. So it's a, it's an actual surround system, sound system, and I'm directly above it. Yay. Hey, I know her. Hey. Oh, hey. That character has a special design. She even has a face. She must be a confidant. <laughs> She has a face. <laughs> she also has a portrait when you talk to her. Punk, punk rock woman is the doctor. And she's the one who's incredibly creepy if you decide to date her. I mean, creepy in that obvious porn video way. But it's it's creepy when you consider it actually happening. Ugh. Just once, I'd like Karusu to actually make friends with a responsible adult. I mean, for a little while, I thought so Sojiro was that person, but then I watched the Valentine's Day episode. Um, 
Yeah, he's a bad influence in at least one way. But, uh... Everyone has their faults. He's the most normal of the adults around, I would think. Oh, no. The most normal is the goddamn fortune teller. <laughs> Which is strange to say. But, like, Sotaro, spoiler alert, used to be a government agent. Like, it's not a huge thing, but it ties him to the plot slightly. Like, he's retired and running this cafe because things went weird and he didn't want to be involved. But, uh... Actually, one of the most interesting things about Sotaro isn't even all that special. It's like on the night before you do the final heist in a dungeon, you talk to him and he says you look super serious. And then when you get back, he says you look really satisfied. And he gives you contradictory advice each time. Is it's like, <laughs> okay. Also, uh, speaking of Sojiro having a weakness for pussy... But I'm Tish. Uh, he, 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 he apparently really likes cute animals. And um, it's like he's really harsh about this cat. But then, like, he immediately softens up. He gives, you a, he gives you a stern lecture about it. And then two seconds later, he comes back with cat food. And I'm like, where, did you, where were you keeping that? You, what? Maybe Why he takes you, in cats, like, in his spare time. <laughs> Why do you even have cat food? What do you what do you volunteer at the at the cat shelter? He just brings a plate of cat food over. It's like it, it, it's never brought up. <laughs> it's never explained. <laughs> he just has this cat food here. <laughs> he just knew this day was coming, you know. <laughs> well, he does he, as as we've seen, he does love pussy. Uh, but like it it's like I I don't get it. But but, like, his rationale for going along with this is, hey, you might stay on good behavior if you're taking care of a pet. When has that ever stopped anyone? No, but there's at least some logic there. There's some logic there, yeah. Wastes a little bit of your time. Like, Wastes yeah. a little bit of time, and, it, you know, if you want to stay around and have fun with your pet, you might not do anything stupid. Yeah, but even Power Girl has a pet cat. And uh, I wouldn't exactly say she stays out of trouble. Ugh. <sighs> But, like, I like how Morgana is is all like, I'm going to become human and everything, but he doesn't he, do, he doesn't have a problem with eating cat food. It's, like, something that is con that you're constantly reminded about is, like, Morgana's eating habits are totally in line with a cat. And Morgana himself does not seem to realize this. It just happens. The fatty tuna! <laughs> Indeed. Ugh. It seriously bugs me that we've had like a week of uh, of like non-eventful evenings, and Karusu has not cleaned this room up, and we have not been given an opportunity to do so. Ugh. I mean, I I understand being tired that first day, but. Uh, it bugs me that we have to wait until we actually have a free night in order to finish cleaning the room. Well, you're busy going into, like, demon worlds and stuff. Well, we weren't for the first few days. I mean, what was Caruso doing with his time? Moping the whole time? Why not? Yeah. But yeah, Morgana's thing is that Morgana can make, um... I infiltration tools. How Morgana manages this with cat paws, I have no idea. But, like, your confidant with Morgana uh, allows you to make infiltration tools, and at a higher rank, you gain more tools. There is a trophy for making all of them, which I have not acquired yet, because if you are making goddamn infiltration tools, you're probably making lockpicks all day, every day. <laughs> Yeah, there are very specific ingredients you need to get in very specific places as well. So, like, when you need yeah. the, this very specific material for, like, one infiltration tool, you gotta go to, like... Okay, Akalabeth Part 3 of the Mementos Dungeon. It's like, okay. <laughs> Akalabeth? Akalabeth, that's it. <laughs> what? <laughs> How was I supposed to know that? No, no, that's not part of... That's not part of Mementos. That's, that's the first Ultima game. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, I don't yeah. memorize every single floor. Yeah, you, you, have to, you have to play a different game to get it. But, but no, but, but you see, that's funny because a Calabeth is a game about randomly generated tunnel dungeons, and that's exactly what Mementos <laughs> is. <laughs> so it's relevant. It's relevant. Yeah, it all works out. But um, the uh, uh, the thing about infiltration tools is that. The, a lot of them are actually really useful, but I've never used any of them but the lockpicks, if that makes any sense. Like, they, they do things like giving you uh, the ability to lessen the, um, the, the alert rating, or to give yourself uh, a bit of stealth like the aerosols from Final Fantasy XIII. That kind of thing. And later on, you get some really good ones. Unfortunately, you do not get to carry your old infiltration tools with you between playthroughs. There is a special infiltration tool later on in the game, which requires some pretty hard-to-farm uh, materials to make, called the Eternal Lockpick. And if you have it, you basically just make... You, you basically can just open every goddamn locked chest in the game without a problem. And, 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 um... And for some reason, Morgana finds this really satisfying because he makes his, oh god, this is going to be good face every time you do it. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, infiltration tools. There's there's quite a few of them, and the ones that unlock later on in the game are really good. Uh, but um, you're probably only going to be able to make a few of them by the end of the game, and I wound up wasting all of them. So... There is a perk to making infiltration tools, however, that does not relate to what tool you made. That's that every time you spend time making infiltration tools, you gain, uh, what is it, proficiency points. So it's it doubles as a means of increasing one of your personality stats. Obviously, that doesn't matter for me, because my Gary Stew powers are at full intensity already, but... I'm perfect. <laughs> I am perfect. Thank you for noticing. Okay, but uh, before we go back into the dungeon, we're actually going to spend a few days doing random bullshit, because it actually is the strategically strategically sound thing to do in this case. Um, that'll make more sense in a few, in, in a few minutes. But first, it's... It, 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 go to sleep! <laughs> son, Let's go, get some go, sleep! Go to sleep. <laughs> But yeah, one of the things that happens when Morgana is with you in, the, in your room is that all the things that you were thinking about when you were examining the room earlier, you can check them out and get some input from Morgana about them. Morgana has interesting input about a bunch of things in the game, so I actually do recommend going out of your way to talk to him. Also, here's all the DLC items that I had at this point in the game. They all just sort of drop into this box out of Jesus nowhere. Jesus Christ! It must... It's like storming outside. There's like this really huge lightning strike. Oh, jeez. I think yeah. I actually heard that. I wasn't sure what it was. I yeah. hate when that happens. I thought you were moving your microphone. <laughs> it's like that happens outside your window. You just turn off all your electronics and huddle in a fetal position in the corner and hope your house doesn't explode. It never <laughs> does, but that doesn't, that doesn't eliminate the fear. Why do you have all those school uniforms in that box? I'm into cosplay, okay? Okay. I, the school uniforms are one thing, but there was also C's armbands and arm PCs. Arm PCs are the things you see you summon demons with in Shin Megami Tensei. If why does this kid have them? He's a really big fan of that game and loves to cosplay it. Anyway, yeah, this is just more kind of saying, hey, sometimes you get lucky and and uh, get a seat on the train. But hey, you know, you're supposed to be a phantom thief now, so you should budget your time really, really well. Maybe we can make use of these days where we have seats on the train. Morgana, where do you get these thoughts, and uh, what part of your brain should I lobotomize to stop you from having them? Because they are not natural. <laughs> Also, several of the dialogue sequences that you overhear on your way into school actually tie into, like, things you can do in the town. This is an important part of the game's design because there's a lot more to do in, there's a lot more to do in Tokyo than there was in the last two games. I mean, in Personas 3 and 4, you just sort of fell into, fell into a sort of feedback loop of going to hang with your social links on days where you could and, and, and going to do one specific thing on days where you couldn't. And on rainy days, maybe you'd go try the Beef Bowl Challenge. But, um... Like, in, Tok in Tokyo, it's like, 
like there's a there's a feedback loop to be found there involving the dining involving the diner i suppose but you have a lot more choices so it's a lot harder to find out what is the most efficient way to go through the game when you're playing blind so your first playthrough you are not going to max out all your social links you are not going to do it don't even try i Just, always you do know. <laughs> well i mean you always try, but you never manage it on your first blind playthrough, do you? I, I always anticipate. I always anticipate that new game plus is I'm going to need every single social stat. So, I, I don't do every single social link. That's for sure. I'm definitely missing out on a few of those, but uh, I will go out of my way to make sure every single social stat is up to their max potential. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Although this game does that thing that um where like there are things early on in in the playthrough that you can't possibly do unless you have a high enough social stat like sassing igor for example or dodging chalk i think that happens today it might not happen today but it happens in at least one of the days in this early in this early section it's like if you have a high enough proficiency score you can dodge chalk when the teacher calls you out on your bullshit and throws it at you otherwise it just hits you the fun thing about dodging chalk is that it boosts your charm. However, <laughs> I only managed to do this once in, in in my first blind playthrough. Ah, yeah, it's happening right here. Epic dodge time. I only managed to do this once in my first playthrough, and my charm stat was already maxed out. So, joke's on me, I suppose. <laughs> I feel a murderous Murder intent. intent. <laughs> These are the sort of moments that, that are designed so that you can take advantage of them if you're using a guide, <laughs> because there's no way you're going to luck apar upon these blindly, unless, well, you really do just bumble into them. I like how after he dodged the chalk, he just puts his head back on his table and just like, whatever. <laughs> <He's just> like, <laughs> <laughs> Play it smooth. Play it smooth, Kurusu. Play it smooth. I mean, the fact that I dodged the chalk meant I was paying attention, right? <laughs> <laughs> Renku up! All right. <laughs> they still show you during your new game plus where you gain points, though. Which is useful for a walkthrough playthrough thing, sort of like these Let's Plays. Because it can it, it lets you basically have, a f have free reign over your schedule and do whatever you want on any given day, and it still shows what bonuses you would have gotten. So if you want to write a guide or, um, or just sort of experiment your way through a new game plus to devise a schedule of your own, you can do that. And I think it was. I think that I think that's always been true of the Persona games that have these calendar schedule systems. Anyway, for some reason, we're making the hideout. The we're making our hideout the rooftop. This is where we go to plan before leaving the school and going into the metaverse. At this point, why not just go into the metaverse and plan there? I mean, I know why they did this. They did this because they wanted to have a June S food court situation where you could go talk and. Uh, sign up for side quests and everything, hey. but um, at, at 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 certain points in the game, it's just kind of awkward. Okay. I mean, it makes the most sense toward the end of the game, where your hideout is literally the protagonist's room with a with a table pulled out. But uh, the school rooftop could have been thought out better. Where can we get this medicine? <laughs> Don't worry, I know just the place. Morgana, you are bullshitting. You do not know that we have a place. You're just hoping that this pans out. And I like how you have the ability to call this out, call him out on it. Like, oh, what business? <laughs> uh, I'm lost here. Your brilliant plan is flying over my frizzy head. I've got a good idea. Anyway, yeah, so the first two days, the first two, three days after, um, after you get on on your party, you want to spend social linking. Why do you want to spend them social linking, you ask? Because getting Ryuji to rank 2 gets, gets him Baton Pass, which will, which will give you a much easier time in the dungeon itself. And uh, starting the social link with the Doctor will actually expand the inventory of the shop. I don't necessarily need to do that myself, because... Um, because I, I I've got a bu I've got a bunch of accessories that I would have been able to buy anyway, but I wanted to show it anyway because, well, it's a handy thing to know. You can get some pretty good healing items there. 
make some good use out of those safe rooms and all. Okay. Now, I don't actually need all of those healing items, though, because I already have a full set of four SP Adhesive 3 accessories. You might have seen me put one on, one on earlier in the part. The SP Adhesive 3 accessory is the most useful thing in the game. Put it on your character, and uh, they'll gain 7 SP per every turn... In a, in a battle, which is enough to basically bam those personas. Yeah, it's enough <laughs> to basically cut your uh, your your MP costs down to a more manageable level. But it also means that if you ever are low on SP, you can go to a weaker part of the dungeon and just and just sit around in a random battle that can't possibly kill you for however many turns it takes for you to actually recharge. And. Um, yeah, it basically breaks the SP management uh, part of the game once you get it. But I think SP Adhesive 3 isn't available in a regular uh, game until you've ranked up the uh, Doctor quite a ways. There's SP Adhesive 1 and 2, but those aren't half as useful uh, because they're, they're, um, their SP gain is uh, a bit lower. But the other cool thing about SP Adhesive 3 is that even though it states that it gives you Invigorate 3 as an ability... It actually stacks with other in invigorate abilities that your persona might have, so if you want to really get ridiculous SP regeneration, you can have a persona on your main character that has invigorate 3, and then you've got this, uh, this uh, accessory that has invigorate 3, so you're gaining 14 SP per turn, and, well, most of your spells don't even cost anything anymore. I think, like, the buffs, like, uh, the group buffs cost 12 SP, maybe. Something like that. Your third tier spells might cost 12. It's going to be like the super special nuke spells that you use once in a blue moon that actually drain your SP somewhat. Okay, so Goth Doctor is really goddamn perceptive. Not that this was hard to see through. I mean, I like how Karusu is all, we'll make something up, all confident, like, on the way in. And this is the best story he comes up with. <laughs> well, let's cut through the bullshit. Lady, I need drugs. Lots of drugs. <laughs> the kind of drugs? I don't care. Just drugs. Really? Lady, you have no idea. So anyway, yeah, this is the start of well, it's not the start of the confidant, but it it, it um it, it, it's 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 sort of sets the stage for it. Like at the start, she's not really asking you to do anything for her, but hey, who cares? I'll sell you some medicine. You seem okay. Why not? Yeah, it's at the start of the confidant, but it is establishing that if you need healing supplies, this is where you go. It's interesting that they make such a production of getting all of your uh, all of your stuff from the different stores in this game, because like in Persona 3, it was just like, hey, this cop can get hold of weapons for us, and it's something that that um, that Mitsuru arranged off stage for you, so it's an arrangement that's already in place, and it was you know kind of shady, but it, it's it's specifically stated that detect that that Kurosawa knows that you're um, that you're. Uh, trying to solve the apathy syndrome cases, so he's helping you out with that. And in Persona 4, uh, there's the wacky general store lady, and that, and she does nothing until Persona 4 Golden, where she runs a nightclub for some reason. And uh, then there's uh, the quirky armor smith, who will just make anything for you if you bring him materials, because art. And it's never explained how he has handguns in stock, but eventually he does, and just in time for Nauto. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, there's a, there's a, there's a big production here for every goddamn. You're fucking um, loaded, dude. Yeah, this is this is actually a pretty small amount of money to be bringing in from a goddamn new game plus. But yeah, I did have a couple hundred thousand yen, which amounts to having two thousand dollars in your pocket. Would a high school kid be carrying that much money? <laughs> <laughs> In cash, even. Yeah, because Japan is, like, a very cash-based country. It, what must this doctor be thinking of the frizzy-haired teenager who just rolled into her, <laughs> into her clinic and bought out all the painkillers? All the painkillers. <laughs> I'll buy all of them. 
Like, I'm pretty sure there's enough dosage in the in, in, on this receipt for, like, a whole goddamn year. And most of it would have gone da gone bad by the time that year was up. So... What's up with this kid? Eh, money's money. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I just funded her medical experiments for the next while. So, you've got no reason to complain, punk doctor. But yeah, since uh, our main character is so good at overhearing things, which is really in keeping with the Harry Potter motif, really, but... Uh, Took lessons yeah. from Joel from Last of Us. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we happen to leave just in time to overhear a really shady conversation between Punk Doctor and Stick Up the Ass Doctor. Which is the actual start of the confidant. I said this before, but um, the confidant storylines tend to start with a uh, sort of random uh, start, uh, starting point and a shady deal being made between you and some other person, and like then like three ranks in uh, a sort of plot line kicks in where you're dealing with their problems. Now, in the previous games, uh, your social link role as the main character was sort of to just sit there and listen while they bared their soul to you progressively more with each rank and sort of worked through their own problems on their own. As a Phantom Thief in Persona 5, eventually you're going to hit a rank where there's no possible solution for them, so you have to do your Phantom Thief thing and uh, steal someone's heart in order to remove a roadblock. Which is unfortunate for the player because it adds an extra day of game time to um, to the process of ranking up your um, social links. Which more of a problem when you're playing blind, to be honest. But if you know what you're doing, you can just sort of collect a bunch of social link side quests and do them all in one day. Because uh, those belong to Mementos, the side quest dungeon. We won't be getting to that for a good long while, so let's just leave that on the table for now. Eventually. Eventually, indeed. Hashtag soon. Ugh, this guy. You see, in hindsight, this conversation makes a lot more sense, but it also makes this guy seem like even more of an asshole. Which, if you've done the side quest, you already know that, but, but like, ugh, makes me want to walk in there and punch him. Which uh, would probably just get me arrested for another assault charge, but there you go. I mean, there's something to be said for playing the role of a character who literally can't indulge the, the urge to just punch someone, because that would get him arrested. Like, it would legitimately get him arrested and thrown in prison. Considering the, the charge he was put on probation for in the first place was assault. Keep the Phantom Thieves a secret, okay? Oh, Morgana, you have no idea how funny that line of dialogue is. <sighs> I said everyone basically finds out that you're a Phantom Thief by the end of this game, and that's basically the, the rank 10 of every confidant in the game, is them finding out you're a Phantom Thief. Oh, by the way, I know. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, Chris, did you know that we're members of the Phantom Thieves? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. I just want to know where does everyone get these cool silhouette-ish icons for their own phone? I'd want one of those. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean icons of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like everyone's got a stylishly drawn cartoon picture of themselves in a in a really, you know, nice uh, picture. And, you know, you could probably see On doing that because On is a, a model and everything. But why does Makoto have one? <laughs> why does Fuji have one? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> now you don't understand. I mean, it's his phone app. It just makes everyone black and white. <laughs> <laughs> It automatically draws anime caricatures of people. Wow, why do we even need character designers anymore? It's a really good Facebook app. <laughs> it also slants the phone screen so that you can hold your phone at a stylish slanted angle and still read everything properly. Phones are weird now. 